The rope around us is getting tighter and tighter. The little faith I used to have has been completely shattered. If God existed, he would certainly not have allowed human beings to be thrown into furnaces alive, or the heads of little children to be smashed with the butts of guns, or shoved into sacks and gassed to death. Sounds like a fairy tale. Those who haven't seen these things would never believe it. But it's no myth. It's the truth. These words were written in 1943 by a 14-year-old Jewish girl called Rutka Laskia. The diary she kept in the ghetto of Benjin in Poland remained hidden from the world for over 60 years. When it came to light in 2006, Rutka was dubbed the Polish Anne Frank. Zahava Schertz is Rutka's half-sister, but she didn't even know of Rutka's existence until she herself was 14. Now, she's on a journey to discover the sister she never knew. I was born in Israel. I was an only child, and we were a family of three. Very happy family, and very small family. Like many children in Israel after the war, Zahava grew up with no extended family. But when I was about 14 years old, I discovered an album which was not in the regular place where my parents used to keep albums. My eye caught this picture of two children, and I saw that the girl looks very much like me. I decided that I'm going to ask my father, who is this? And he said, these are Rutka and Henius. They were my children, and they were murdered in the Holocaust by the Nazis. Zahava's father revealed that he had been married before, in Poland before the Second World War. The family had been transported to Auschwitz. His wife and children were killed. He alone had survived. He remarried and made a new life in Israel. This was a big shock, a big surprise to me but we didn't talk a lot about it. My parents didn't want me to grow up with the shadows of the Holocaust. Zahava's father, Yaakov, died in 1986. She thought she'd hear no more about his lost family. Then, in 2006, Zahava received a phone call from a man she didn't know. He said, are you the daughter of Yaakov Lasker? And they said, yes, I am. Uh, do you know if he had a daughter named Rutka? And I said, yes, he did. He said, I have to tell you something. In Poland, they discovered a diary written by a girl named Rutka Lasker. We think it's the daughter of your father. And I, I thought that I'm going to faint. Since then, <laughs> I have a sister. <laughs> really, because since then I started a journey in discovering Rutka. Rutka's original handwritten diary is now held at the Yad Vashem Center in Jerusalem. It's part of the collection of evidence here documenting some of the six million individuals who were murdered in the Holocaust, as the Nazis tried systematically to exterminate the entire Jewish people. After the Germans invaded Poland at the beginning of World War II, they forced the Jews into confined areas known as ghettos, where they could be strictly controlled. In one such ghetto, Rutka wrote her diary. When you read Rutka's story, you read the unique testimony of the Holocaust and a story of an adolescent in a very dreadful times. Zahava has come to Yad Vashem to look at Rutka's original diary with the man who first called her about it, 80-year-old Menachem Lior. He's a Holocaust survivor and remembers Rutka from the town of Benjin in Poland where they both grew up. She was a beautiful girl and she was very, very magic. 
Show something special. Zahava has been able to read the diary in translation, but this is the first time she's had a chance to examine the real thing. This is the diary. It's very beautiful yeah, handwriting. It's unbelievable. You know, as a matter of fact, it's the first time that I have a chance to really look at it uh, and, and to hold it in my hand. This is something that is unbelievably exciting for me. And I can't believe that it survived all this year and in pretty, pretty good condition, I would say. Pretty good God condition. Touching the ink for 70 years ago, and you're going back to Rutka, to all the time, to 43. It's just like electrolytes, you guys. Yeah. Something special. Rutka's slim notebook covers just three months, between January and April 1943. Not yet 14, she's already a veteran of the ghetto. I can't believe it's already 1943. Four years since this hell began. The diary is a potent mix. The intimate thoughts and feelings of a teenage girl, alongside vivid descriptions of Nazi atrocities. I have a feeling that I'm writing for the last time. There's a roundup of Jews in town. I'm not allowed to go out, and I'm going crazy, imprisoned in my own home. You can see the pen that she's using. You can even see her emotions. The handwriting is getting wild a little bit, and it makes you feel like you are there. All these 60-something uh, years didn't pass by. I think Rutka's diary and her story are special. She offers us an insight into things that we might not have otherwise, especially from these young eyes that are a mixture of youth and adult all at once, you know, adult experience with youth emotions. So I, I think we've got something really quite unusual here. I was afraid from the beginning if this is a real diary, a genuine diary. After I read it, I was sure, because he mentioned something about love with a boy, named Monik was my friend. This can only three people know about it, Rutka, Monik, and I. And she wanted to be kissed, you know, and yes. I don't think she, she got a chance. She got, she got a chance, yes. She did? She did. OK. <laughs> <laughs> to understand more about Rutka and her diary, Zahava is making the journey from Israel to Rutka's hometown of Benjin in Poland. Close to what was then German territory, Benjin was occupied within days of the Nazi invasion in September 1939. Five centuries of vibrant Jewish life and culture came to a brutal end. The Nazis began by confining the Jews to a small area of town, the ghetto. I would like to pour out on paper all the turmoil I'm feeling inside, but I just can't do it. Sometimes I'm in such a foul mood that when I open my mouth, it's only to snap at people. Other days, I'm bursting with joy and could laugh all day long. I had a kind of empty hole in my life. I grew up with no close relatives, and it is not natural. This trip in Poland is an opening for me to know better my family. Benjin used to be a very religious Jewish community. It was vivid and full with life. One thing which was good for me is the fact that it didn't change much. It is very much preserved. You can really feel how it used to look. The first person Zahava wants to see is the man responsible for publishing the diary in Poland. Adam Shidlowski is Benjin's registrar of births, deaths, and marriages. He's also set up an organization to rehabilitate the town's lost Jewish heritage. Adam has offered to take Zahava to the house in the former ghetto where Rutka wrote her diary and where she hid it in the hope that it would one day be found. This is the house. This is the house of Rutka. Mm -hmm. Wow. And where did they live? In which floor? In the in this floor? Or next, up? next floor. Second floor. Second floor. Several Jewish families, including Rutgers, 
were made to share this house. The Nazis forced the Polish family who'd owned it before the war to find somewhere else to live. Their daughter, Stanislava, would come back occasionally to check up on the place. To ja skoczyłam do domu zawsze tam zobaczyć, co się w tym domu moim dzieje. I tam właśnie na podwórku w swoim domu spotkałam Rutkę. No i od tego się zaczęła nasza znajomość. To jest ten pokój, w którym mieszkali Laskierowie. Te warunki, które Laskierowie mieli, no i tak możemy dzisiaj określić jako w miarę dobre. W którym mieszkała Rutka, Rutka mieszkała ze swoją mamą ze swoim tatą, z braciszkiem Joachimem. Mum gets upset and screams at me because of Henius. He's a sweet little thing, but sometimes he can be pretty obnoxious. I can't say anything in front of him because he goes and tells everything to the old folks. I think the diary was a spot of privacy for Rutka. I imagine that she would write in the diary when the apartment was empty, I think you needed to have somebody to talk to, and maybe those days she had two people. She had the diary, and she had Stanislava Sapinska. Rutka była piękna, piękna dziewczyna była, zwłaszcza oczy, 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 oczy. Więc ona wiedziała, że ona jest ładna. Although I don't usually look good in photographs, I'm in fact quite pretty. I'm tall, thin, my legs aren't too bad. I have big black eyes, short black hair, nicely outlined lips. And there's my portrait. I'm very curious to see where did she hide the diary. Proszę, pokażę ci to miejsce. Bardzo proszę. Rutka zdawała sobie z tego sprawę, że kiedyś to może nastąpić. Że chciałaby, żeby ten pamiętnik pozostał. I jej pokazałam to miejsce. To są schody, co teraz już murowane, ale w czasie getta były drewniane i możemy przypuszczać z tego, co Stasia mówiła, że w połączeniu już ostatniego stopnia z podłogą była naturalna nisza, którą można było wsunąć a, dosyć on, cienki. Tak, on został wsunięty pomiędzy okay. schody a podłogą. Wow. After the Nazis cleared the ghetto, Stanislava returned to look for the diary. No, znalazłam taki pamiętnik i włożyłam do biblioteczki i trzymałam w biblioteczce. Ja to traktowałam jako swoją osobistą pamiątkę. It was only by chance that Adam Shedlowski got to hear about the diary over 60 years later. He immediately realized its historical value. Within months, it had been published. Stanislava sometimes misses the diary now that it's in the Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum. But Zahava and Adam have a surprise for her. I, I want to give you a present. It's on the memory of Rutka's diary. Thank you very much. This is Rutka's diary. It's a facsimile. It's like the original. And it's that. so you remember Rutka, mm -hmm. you remember the diary, and you will remember what you have done for me, the memories and the sister that you gave me. It's like Dziękuję. the original. Dziękuję. The publication of Rutka's diary was a big event in Benjin. It's now part of the curriculum at the local elementary school. Hello. 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 We are very glad that we have Sister Odrut Karaskia over here in our school. Now we are waiting for Easter and according to Polish traditions, we would give you this festive decoration. It's for you. Thank you very, very much. So what is the project that are, the children are doing? The project is about uh, Jewish history in Benjin, and we also read the diary of Ruth Kalaska. I understand you all read the book that Ruth Kalaska wrote and the 
as you are very close to the age she was when she wrote the diary, I wonder which part did you like the best? What did you choose? Ja wybrałam fragment, jak Rutka opisuje siebie, jaka jest. Okay, can, can you read it? Mówią, że jestem inteligentna, wykształcona. They say I'm intelligent, educated, well, maybe. I'm a bit nutty. I like telling people in the face exactly what I think about them. I also sometimes like to dress in a crazy manner. Basically, I couldn't care less. I am who I am, and nothing could possibly change that. See you later. My diary. That's very nice. Thank you very much. When I read it, I saw a lot of similarities between me and Rutka. Rutka shows me that I can't wear a mask at home, but I'm also like that. Despite her circumstances, Rutka reveals all the normal concerns of a teenage girl. Tomorrow I will have to settle things with Yannick. I'll tell him that if he wants to be my friend, he has to be on time. Or else, adios. Obviously not in those words exactly. I couldn't care less about him. But I'm curious to see the look on his face. Mitska came round with lots of gossip. Someone told her I'd cut my hair to please Yannick, that I put on silk stockings for Yannick, and so on. That's a total lie, as if I even cared about him. Why did you choose this? What did you feel? Widać tutaj, że ona była normalną nastolatką i borykała się z tymi problemami, co my. Tak samo jak z Jankiem i z tymi plotkami, które rozsiały się wokół niej i myślę, że nie podobało się jej to za bardzo. Sama jak taka właśnie dziewczyna z dzisiejszych czasów. Rutka's diary entries move seamlessly between the everyday thoughts of a young girl and the brutal reality of life in the ghetto. I'm so saturated with the horrors of this war that even the worst things I hear have no effect on me. I just can't believe that one day I'll be able to go out without a yellow star or that this war will ever end. What is your reaction to life in the ghetto? Ghetto to było miejsce zamknięte, nie można było stamtąd wychodzić. Tak jak w więzieniu. Rutka opisała to wręcz przepięknie. Opisała swoje życie. To, żeby następne pokolenia mogły zobaczyć, coś tam dokładnie działo. Było to wręcz życie okropne, piekło. I couldn't say it better than you. Thank you. Rutka was a teenager. And to see these girls reading from the diary, choosing the part they liked. All of a sudden, there was Rutka for me in many, many voices. Before they were sent to the ghetto in 1939, the Laskia family lived in a middle-class area in the center of town. It was once the heart of a vibrant Jewish community. Wow. This is the house where Utka's family, my father's family, lived before the war. I wondered whether the house exists or whether it was destroyed, but I couldn't believe that it is kind of in, in between. There were very modern people, and they were very prosperous, very well-to-do. They used to go skiing in the winter, and in the summertime they would go to the seashore. That very nice life. I think it is very important to remember because that again gives us the connection to the people they really were, because they not really were the people that the German decided to, to diminish. They were people like you and me, like everybody, and they, it, you can really feel it from Rutka's, from Rutka's notebook. I'm completely absorbed with the longing for something beautiful, wonderful and distant. When I'm standing by the riverside and looking at a gushing waterfall, I feel something inside of me being lifted and taken far away. The quality of Rutka's writing is remarkable. She had talent, but also a good education. Rutka attended the Furstenberg Gymnasium, 
a private school for Jews, which is now a Polish state school. One of her close friends here was Linka Gold, who managed to escape from the ghetto and now lives in London. At 79, she's the same age Rutka would have been. Before the war, it was a very happy-go-lucky atmosphere. Rutka was an attractive young girl, slim and tall, and she was very intelligent. She was a good pupil. And she had followers, a lot of boys, you know. I think my womanhood has awoken in me. Yesterday, when I was taking a bath and the water stroked my body, I longed for someone's hands to caress me. I didn't know what it was. I've never felt like this before. Well, this is the first time I'm here, and I'm really, really very excited. The minute I came in, it was what I expected, like an old gymnasium from the last century. It is really exciting to know that Rutka was here and studied here, and it's, it's very meaningful. Rutka mentions a number of boys in her diary, most frequently one called Yannick. Był u mnie południu Yannick. Yannick came around this afternoon. While we were talking, he suddenly blurted out he'd like it very much if he could kiss me. I said, maybe, and continued the conversation. But I won't let him kiss me. I'm afraid it would destroy something beautiful, pure. I'm also afraid that I'll be very disappointed. Rutka była ładna, przyjemna i inteligentna, więc chłopakom się bardzo podobała. I ona o tym doskonale wiedziała, że ona się podoba chłopakom. Mam zamiar. I've decided to let Janik kiss me. Eventually someone will kiss me for the first time. So let it be Janik. Niech to będzie Janik. Do you like him? Jego przecież. No, a miała konkurentki w koleżankach z kolei. A on, jak Janek, latał tu i tam. Posprzeczali się, to już, to już nie, nie lubi mnie tego, ale, ale cały czas myślała o Janku. Cały czas. Zdaje się, już zupełnie zwariowałam. I think I've gone completely crazy. Today, when I wake up, I realize that I no longer have any affection for Janek. Dla Janka. Most than half a century passed, but I think still relationships, it's the same there and the same today, and I think that is why it is so interesting for young people to read Rutka's diary, to identify with people that lived 70 years ago and were quite the same. They just had very different, very different end, very different fate. Shortly before the Nazis invaded and closed all the schools in Benjin, Rutka wrote a dedication in her friend Linka's notebook. Here it is. Ku pamięci. Ku pamięci means to your memory. Enjoy every bit of your luck and the moments of your luck, because they will fly away like the butterflies and afterwards will be painful and you'll feel sorry for yourself. Rutka. Only a tiny minority of the Jews who lived in Benjin before the war survived the Holocaust. One of them is the man who first told Zahava about Rutka's diary, Menachem Lior. Menachem has a fascinating story. He escaped and he arrived to Israel when there was still war in Europe. And there are very, very few, very few cases like that. He uh, was one year older than Rutka and he used to know her. Menachem has come to Benjin to share his memories of the ghetto with Zahava. We were 27,000 Jews in Benjin approximately 50 or 60 percent of the population. It was a very, very nice life in Benjamin. But when the war started, everything changed. We were afraid every day what would happen to us. 
this was an area where many Jews lived. There's a church, there is a castle, and it used to be here a big synagogue. When we were children, came here to play, especially Saturday or on occasions. It's very beautiful. It, it was very beautiful. It was for us an attraction to run between the walls of the castle. It was a very nice place. The main synagogue here. Yes. Where was it exactly? Where the yes, monument is? Here, yes. And How I big was, was it? It was very big. How many people could it hold? A uh, few hundred people. Wow. What happened when the Nazis invaded Benjamin? They occupied the town. They closed all the schools. They closed all the factories. They closed all the business of the Jews. Mm. They confiscated everything. What happened to the synagogue? After a week, then they were in Benjamin. They burned the synagogue with all the people that were inside. One of the first major events that was seared into the memories of the people of Benjamin was the burning of the synagogue, this, the main synagogue in Benjamin, with Jews inside of it who had been forced inside. That happened right after the Nazis conquered. This is part of a larger picture. In Poland, we're talking about thousands of synagogues destroyed. And the ones that were left standing were the ones that were used either as refugee centers or as uh, storage rooms and stables for the Germans. This monument is a symbol for the memory of the citizens of the city that were killed viciously by the German Nazis in the time of the Holocaust in the year 1939-1945. The friends of Benjamin built this monument in the place where the synagogue was standing and it was burned and destroyed by the Nazis occupation 8th of September, 1939. In this first phase of their persecution, the Nazis forced some 20,000 Jews to gather their possessions and move into the poorest area of town. Here, they were exploited as slave labor. There was virtually no food for those who couldn't work. Kidnappings and beatings were commonplace, and a strict curfew was enforced on pain of death. The Nazis classified the Jews as subhuman. It wasn't a pleasant feeling. Someone was watching you all the time. And I was scared because to shoot a person for the Germans was just like having a piece of cake. So. We had to be very careful. I am sick of these grey houses, of the fear painted on every face, fear which grips everyone and won't let go. Everywhere people are queuing up, queuing for potatoes, coal, bread. A policeman pushed an old man. He fell and hit his head on the cobbles. Over there, a woman is crying. Her husband has been arrested. Who knows if she'll ever see him again? I remember horrible things it happened in front of my house. We came home and on the trees were two bakers hanged. Why? Because they baked some bread for people. This I remember, which was very unpleasant and frightening. The Nazis had worse horrors in store for the Jews of Benjin, as Rutger recollects in her diary. On the 12th of August, 1942, some 30,000 people were told to gather at a sports ground next to the railway line. Rutka, her parents, and five-year-old brother Henius arrived here at crack of dawn. The stadium has since been demolished to make way for Benjamin's main bus station. But this has not dimmed Menachem's memory of that day. I was here. I was a young child. 
a young boy. We were all together here, families, friends, waiting for something that we didn't know what. Most of the town was here. And suddenly we saw soldiers surrounding us with machine guns. When we saw the soldiers, we understood that something is going to happen here. I looked beyond the fence and saw soldiers with machine guns aimed at us. People fainted, children were crying. In short, judgment day. When my memory is very vivid, they gathered us all on the football grounds and they made a selection. Nazi policy toward the Jews was becoming ever more draconian. The young and able-bodied were still to be used as forced labor, but those considered unproductive were to be rounded up for extermination. At three o'clock, the selection started. Group one meant you could go home. One A meant going to the labor camps. Two meant going for further inspection. And three meant deportation. In other words, death. Number three was Aussiedlung, which means sending to Auschwitz. And, and you knew that this is the, the end. I, I think maybe for Rutka it was this time that she really realized that the plan is to kill the Jews. I think the first yeah. time that not only Rutka, that everyone realized that they, they decided to kill the Jews. In such situation, you don't feel nothing. You, you, are, you are empty. Yeah. Just empty yeah. for feelings. When the last year's turn came for selection, Rutka's parents and little brother were put into the group to be sent back home. But Rutka, along with her friend Linka Gold, was selected for the group to be deported to forced labor camps. I walked over in a daze. Linka Gold was already there. The weirdest thing was that there were no tears, absolutely none. When I saw her, I said, keep together, let's, let's stick together. But she disappeared from the crowd. And I never saw her again. Then all of a sudden, it started pouring. Little children were lying on the wet grass as the storm raged above our heads. The police were beating people ferociously and firing their guns. I sat there until one o'clock at night. Part of the Nazi process often in a roundup was beatings and shootings. And Rutka describes that in the August 1942 mass deportation. Terrorizing populations into submission is something the Nazis were very good at. They don't want people to stop and think about options. What does this mean? What can I do? Where can I hide? But if you're being yelled at, beaten over the head, shot at, the natural human instinct is to run for cover, go like that and just do what they say. And that's exactly what they wanted. There's the Polish area here and not far from the center. The Nazis organized the deportations with great efficiency. The selection took place just yards from the railway lines, which led to the labor camps or to the death camps at Auschwitz, just 20 miles away. This was the station. There was a station, station, there, a station of Venge. And that was the station from which they were taken to Auschwitz? I think so. In this, from this area, they took the people to Auschwitz. Yeah. Rutger had been taken to a nearby building to await deportation to the labor camps. Imagining this to be a prospect even worse than death, she decided to risk everything. I ran away. My heart was pounding. I jumped out of a window on the first floor of a small building. On the street, I ran into someone in uniform. I was pretty sure he was going to beat me, but apparently he was drunk and didn't see my yellow star and he let me go. My head was spinning. The ran me was dark, like in a prison cell. But from time to time, flashes of lightning lit up the sky and it thundered. The journey home that normally takes me half an hour, I did in 10 minutes. She ran away from the roundup in Benjen, and that was risky and courageous. Most people who tried to run, as far as we know, were shot. So she evaded that as well. And I think that that also it not only reflects her courage and her initiative, that she saw a situation and said, I've got to get out of here. 
but it also reflects a sort of uh, watershed. After that, although she's still a, an adolescent teenager, she's also a grown-up. She has an understanding of the world that most people never have. More than 4,500 Jews were transported to their deaths at Auschwitz following the roundup. Rutger had escaped, as had Linka Gold, with help from a family friend. Back in the ghetto, Rutger describes how she was forced to start work in a Nazi sweatshop. On Monday, I've got to be at the factory by 6.30 a.m. 6.30 is terribly early. I wonder what kind of job I'll have. Rutka was set to work as a seamstress, probably in a uniform factory. The days go by. Every day it's the same grisly day. I work from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's bearable. The work is quite easy. I'm getting through it somehow. Forced labor and exploitation of Jews was a clear Nazi policy from the very beginning. It was absolute exploitation for the benefit of the Third Reich. Jews in Benjamin, many of them being skilled laborers because of, of the industries in the area, uh, and others being uh, craftsmen, tradesmen, were very useful to the Nazis because they gave them something. So you have the development of what was known as shops, which uh, kind of workshops in various fields, textiles, shoemakers, and things like that, and they would work for the Nazis. And if you work as a Jew, then they don't send you away somewhere. And you also have the right to eat, because Jews don't have access to a grocery store. They have access to a food distribution center, but only if you're qualified. And if you work, you're qualified for yourself and several family members. So work for the Jews was a ticket to remaining alive. For a while, Polish industry was considered vital to the German war effort. But once the Nazis had decided on their so-called final solution, the extermination of the Jews took precedence over exploiting their labor. For Rutka and so many like her, it was the beginning of a descent into hell. Something has broken in me. When I pass by a German, everything seems to shrink inside me. I don't know whether it's out of fear or hatred. I saw how a soldier tore a baby, who was only a few months old, out of its mother's arms and bashed its head against a lamppost. The baby's brain splashed on the wood. The mother went crazy. I'm writing this as if nothing has happened, as if I were in an army and experienced in cruelty. But I'm young. I'm 14. I haven't seen much in my life and I'm already so indifferent. I'm turning into an animal waiting to die. Rutka was very reflective. I mean, she was able to look at herself and to realize what's happening to her personality. She says, I'm getting used to see this horrible thing. What, what kind of person am I? It's very sad. The fact that this young girl was witness to that. In the spring of 1943, the Nazis started preparing for the ultimate fate of Benjamin's Jews. First, the entire population was crammed into an even smaller ghetto called Kamionka on the outskirts of town. This is Kamionka. Here was the ghetto. It was a Polish area before the ghetto. No Jews were here. Yes. They threw out all the Polish people and put us in. They put many families in one apartment, wow. in one room, seven, eight people. It was very crowded. So life was impossible. It's hard life, not impossible, hard life. Hard life. I wish I could leave all this behind and run away from all this grayish rottenness spread my wings and fly high and far away. Hear the wind howling, feel it blowing on my face. Fly to places where there are no ghettos, no workshops, no pretending. Enough now. I'm going to sleep. All the time she was very much scared of moving to Kamionka. We were afraid. 
Yes, you are afraid of, of the change. Both birth, you have less space and room to live. This was the kind of dehumanization yeah, that true. the Nazis yeah, did true. to the Jews. They lost their dignity, they lost their comfort, we, we, they lost we, we, their we, we try freedom. Not, we tried not to lose our dignity, we tried, but it you was tried. hard. You tried, yes, but yes, that's but what they hard. wanted yeah. you to do. Yes, but it was very hard. Yeah. And, uh, we tried not to lose. We were young, but old, what happened to us? Yes, very young in, in, in age, but old with other feelings. We suddenly lose our youth. You lose your life. You lose your life, you lose your friends, you lose your family. You lose everything that was close to you. The sun is shining so brightly. Outside the windows, apple trees and lilacs are blooming. And you have to sit in this suffocating and stinking room. To hell with it. The town is already empty. Almost everyone lives in Kamionka. We'll probably move there this week. This was the last entry Rutka made in her diary on April 24th, 1943. <laughs> Fearing that her diary would not survive, she hid it under the stairs as arranged with Stanislava. There's no record of what happened to the family in the months after they were moved here to Kamionka. But in August, the Nazis carried out their final liquidation of the Jews in Benjin. They took out the people from the houses, brought them to the station, put them on the train and sent to Auschwitz. Very efficient. Very efficient. The Laskier family were amongst 30,000 Jews taken to Auschwitz. The registration card of Rutger and Zahava's father, Yaakov, shows that he was taken there with his wife, Dorka, and their children, Rutger and Henius, on August the 5th. He told Zahava how the infamous Auschwitz doctor, Josef Mengele, was waiting for them when they were unloaded from the cattle trucks. They went there, there was Dr. Mengele, and he remembered him very, very vividly. And he hated this man, and he said he was standing there, and he was the one who decided to send the three, Ruth Kazhenius and Dorka, to one side and him to the other side. And that was the last time he saw his family. That meant that he will be sent to work and maybe will have a chance to survive and they for sure will send to the crematorium, to the gas chamber. And uh, he knew it very well. And that was pretty much, as far as I know, the end. Very, very sad end of beautiful girl, very talented. This is the story of my family. This is the story of uh, many Jewish families in Eastern Europe in that time. But a startling new revelation may mean that Rutka was not taken directly to the gas chambers with the others. During the making of this film, Adam Shidlovsky was contacted with a disturbing new piece of information. In 1947, a young girl called Sophia Mintz had dictated a witness statement detailing her memories of Auschwitz. Zosi Mintz, who, in one of the few words, in one of the few of her memories, dedicates the tragic death of Rutki Laskier. I can tell you that I didn't sleep after the whole night, when I got it, I read it. Obok mnie w bloku sypiała moja koleżanka, Rutka Laskier z Będzina. Była taka śliczna, że nawet doktor Mengele zwrócił na nią uwagę. Wtedy wybuchła epidemia tyfusu i cholery. Rutka zachorowała na cholerę i w ciągu kilku godzin zmieniła się nie do poznania. 
Sama zawiozłam ją na taczce od śmieci do krematorium. Błagała mnie, bym zawiozła ją do drutów, to rzuci się na nie i prąd elektryczny ją zabije. Ale za taczką szedł esesman z karabinem i nie pozwolił na to. Śmierć wydarzyła się w krematorium, bo Rutka podejrzewam nie miała już siły yy, iść, więc ona ją zawiozła. The new revelation has made headlines in Benjin. Sofia Mintz didn't arrive at Auschwitz until several months after Rutka. If Rutka lived, as it implies six more months, it is very sad. I rather not think about it. I would rather think what I used to believe that Rutka died immediately. For now, that's what I want to believe. Whatever the exact details, Rutka died at Auschwitz, along with many of her close family members. Just a few of the six million murdered, 30,000 of them from Benjin. Memory of over 30,000 Jews from Benjamin. We've settled here for ages and generations and have been taken away and murdered by the Nazis, 1939, 1945. It's very symbolic, it's very symbolic. Zahava's father, Yakov, survived a number of labor camps. After the war, he tried to make his way to Palestine, along with many thousands of other Jewish refugees. The ship he was traveling on was turned away by the British, and he was sent to a detainment camp in Cyprus. Here, he met his future wife. Through all my life, I felt so sorry for him to lose children, and I couldn't understand how could he get his life back again. But he was a strong man with a lot of energy to continue. He was a wonderful person. I was very fortunate to have a father like this. Having finally made it to Palestine, Yaakov remarried in 1947, and Zahava was born two years later. Long before she heard that Rutka kept a diary, Zahava named her own daughter after the half-sister she knew so little about. Rutka was always a bit special to me since I'm named after her. I have the dark hair and eyes, so I guess I look a little bit like her, yeah. In a mysterious way, I always felt very close to Rutka and that I called my daughter Ruth. Ruth now has two daughters of her own. Rutka wanted the diary to be found. She knew that she's not going to survive the war. She wanted somebody to find it and to make it known to the world. And apparently this somebody is me. At my age, to find a sister and to get to know her through a diary, this is a, an experience that Nobody imagined it will happen to them. At daybreak, I got up and ran to the window. A tiny bit of golden sunlight was already peeking over the horizon. Less than half an hour later, I was at the foot of the mountain. I climbed higher and higher. More and more often, rocks blocked my way. Piles of rocks stained with moss and roots of trees were twisted like embracing snakes. The sun flooded the mountain with its golden rays and outlined the green of the grass. In the distance, a thin bluish streak of smoke lit by shepherds could be seen far away. <laughs> <laughs> 